Well, welcome Foreign Entanglements viewers to this uh, special emergency session of Foreign Entanglements. Uh, with me today is uh, Dan Nixon of Georgetown, who is even wearing a Georgetown uh, uh, sweatshirt this morning. Um, our topic for the day is going to be the, uh, the first clash of arms, uh, in a sense, between NATO and Russia in quite some time. A, uh, two Turkish F-16s have shot down a Russian Su-24 fencer, um, either over Turkish or over Syrian territory. Um, the president of Russia is understandably incensed, uh, and uh, Turkey has called for a special meeting of NATO. So you've been following the news this morning, Dan. What does it look like to you is going on? Well, I mean, it looks like what the news says, right, which is that the, the Turks have gotten sick of the penetration of Russian jets into their airspace and mm -hmm. have taken action. Um, I mean, I think that this was something that a lot of people worried about, and it's something that wasn't completely unexpected. Right. Um, I think you made some comment somewhere, uh, maybe on your blog, that, you know, on the one hand, you know, it certainly looks like the Turks are being a little hair trigger, you know, that these violations of airspace, while an affront to sovereignty and honor, are not terribly consequential in mm -hmm. geostrategic terms, um, although we could sort of explore why states might be a little bit worried about Russia trampling over their borders these days. Um, but on the flip side, um, I'm not, I'm a little sanguine, mm -hmm. right? I think that um, nobody really wants to start any sort of a major conflict between NATO and Russia right now. There are a lot of interests within the alliance against it. I don't think Turkey is terribly interested in it either. Um, and so, you know, this may prompt another round of deconfliction, another round of arm waving, hand pointing, uh, but there are risks and we mm -hmm. shouldn't ignore those risks. Right. I mean, so this is happening against a backdrop and this is a case in which, you know, I think we, at least to my mind, there have, we have probably associated the Ukrainian crises and the Syrian crises too much um, in our minds over the past year and a half. But this is a case in which there seem to be clearly dynamics between the two that are associated, right? Because there has been this pattern of Russian testing of NATO, and not just NATO, but also Swedish and Finnish airspace, which has been pretty much consistent since the Ukrainian crisis began. Um, and since the Russian deployment of forces into Syria, we've seen very similar behavior along the Turkish-Syrian border, right? And so it's not, it's not unreasonable, as you suggest, for the Turks to be on a bit of a, a hair trigger about this, um, and for all of NATO to be on a bit of a hair trigger about this. And it's also, it's not just a pair of fighter jocks or attack plane jocks, right? This is a concerted Russian policy to uh, test the air borders of NATO for quite some time. Maybe for a different reason here than than in Norway, but still, I mean, this is not completely outside of what they're doing with the U-95s flying uh, into near Scottish airspace and so forth. I mean, that's a real question, right? Because, you know, we've been observing the airspace violations and presumably also um, uh, sea jurisdiction violations by mm -hmm. the Russians for a while, and I think my read, which is consistent with how most people have interpreted what the Russians are up to, is that this is a form of muscle flexing, right? right. It's a form of sort of saying, hey, we're back, pay attention to us. Um, I've even sort of described it in various settings as, as Russia falling back on its kind of Cold War repertoire for how it asserts its great power status, right. how it tests its neighbors. And my view, broadly speaking, has been that this is self-defeating. Right. right, that the major implication of what Russia's been doing is to push Sweden and Finland toward NATO mm -hmm. to activate the sort of old style alliance to make NATO countries that may not have seen Russia as a threat to see them as a threat. Um, so the real question, right, is, is whether this is linked, right, mm -hmm. whether Russian behavior along the Turkish border is sort of part and parcel of that kind of impulse or whether it's more operational, right, right? right. you know. Um, in a, in a, you know, it, I don't know, you would, this is your area, right? I don't know mm -hmm. enough about um, Russian Air Force capabilities uh, to, un, to really have a sense of how, how capable they are of knowing at any given moment whether they're right on or across the border, at least their, their, their fighter mm -hmm. jocks are. I mean, what's your sense of that? 
I, I think there are some legit questions about um, about uh, sort of how capable Russian fighter and attack jocks are, but uh, the deployment to Syria is supposed to, and you would expect to be the best pilots that they have, right? Because they're the only pilots who are, gonna, who are we getting going to be getting operational experience right now. Um, the Turks have said, and I trust the Turks on this point, um, that they repeatedly warned the Russian aircraft. Now, there have been some reports out there that the Russians just turn off their communications equipment and turn off their transponders when they're close to the Turkish border so that they don't have to pretend that they don't hear the Turks. I mean, they literally don't hear the Turks. Um, in which case, this really, I mean, that really invites an incident like this. I mean, there have also been uh, reports, and you've probably seen this morning, and this complicates the issue a little bit from the NATO perspective, that the, the Turkish interest here is less in the defense of its airspace um, than in the protection of Turkish allies just across the Syrian border. So uh, Turkmen that the Russians have been bombing uh, instead of bombing ISIS, um, and that this aircraft almost certainly was bombing instead of bombing ISIS. No ISIS in this, in this region. Um, and, uh, you know, apparently Erdogan made a, a clear warning with respect to attack on, these attacks on Turkish proxies to the Russians. Um, and that complicates the issue a little bit, at least from, from where NATO is standing, or it would seem to complicate it a little bit from, from, from NATO's stance, if this is a protection of Turkish interests outside of the alliance. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think uh, those of us who sort of are in the, the national security, foreign policy, scholar policy nexus, I think, understand pretty well that some of the interests that you're talking about, right? So, you know, there, there's no confusion for us. This is not, a, as you say, it's not about bombing ISIS here. Uh, it's about um, bombing uh, groups that are supported by, quote-unquote, Western powers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about the Russian strategy of, of reinforcing Assad, uh, primarily, you know, as it was initially, primarily going after the people who were uh, most threatening in the, in the west of Syria, Mm -hmm. uh, but also the people who provided the only viable alternative in Western eyes, right? So, you know, if you look at what the Russians were up to initially, it looked like they were doing something that was actually rooted in Assad's playbook, right? Which mm -hmm. is to ensure that the only viable insurgency left was somebody who was, that ISIS or, or some other Islamist groups that were simply intolerable uh, for everyone else. And that way you, you, you put the West in this position of either you support Assad or you de-escalate against Assad or you support... Uh, Islamists, mm -hmm. right? And so I think we, I think you're right. We we maybe take for granted that that everybody understands this aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. That that the Russians did not stray into Turkish airspace, uh, going after ISIS targets, uh, and also that the Turks have sort of no, in the assumption that the Turkish have no sort of geostrategic interests in Syria whatsoever. In fact, they have very profound geostrategic interests in Syria, right? So. So uh, apparently Putin this morning has been pushing very hard on this, um, which certainly has made its way into the Western media. And so it's not a surprise that um, Turkey's approach to the conflagration in Syria is complicated, right? That they are not... Um, they, 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 they are not as, uh, as committed members of Team Anti-ISIS as, as you would hope, um, uh, in, for a variety of reasons, both the anti-Assad, because of the concern about Kurdish expansion. But Putin this morning has been very hard on Turkey as a financer and protector of ISIS. Um, yeah, know. although you have to be careful there, because the Russians describe anybody who's anti-Assad as terrorists. So when right. they say, um, you know, we were bombing terrorists' interests and, the, and Turkey's supporting terrorists, that doesn't mean that they mean ISIS. Right. Right. So. Right. 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 Um, right. Um, but in this case, there is at least some conflict on the on the Turkish part. Right. The, the Turkish the Turks are conflicted about the anti ISIS campaign about whether um, this will result in helping the Kurds, well, or whether it will result in a stronger Kurdish state. And so, but it's interesting that that seems to be the direction that the Russians are going to push in in propaganda terms. Um, so. Given what we know about how states and how organizations manage crises, I mean, you, you, yes, you suggested earlier that we're going to see some additional deconfliction moves from NATO and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, is that how you see the rest of this playing out? Is there is there a danger that there's going to be some sort of spiral with how NATO and, uh, or primarily U.S., but also U.S. and French and Russian aircraft are going to operate, be operating over Syria right now? Or is NATO going to have some sort of broader response? So the big fear, right, is that um, the 
and I, I want to be careful here. when I say the big fear, I don't mean that anybody in the spiral that we're about to discuss is mm-hmm. behaving inappropriately, right? But the sort of bad scenario that's immediately connected to the shoot down of the of the it's the SU twenty four, right? Yeah. Um, is that uh, NATO uh, reaffirms its commitments to defend NATO territory uh, and to defend the Turks. Mm-hmm. Um, the Russians view this as a provocation. Um, you know, they lost their fighter jet. They clearly don't think that anything they did warrants having their fighter jet shot down. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the Russians take this as um, as uh, essentially a... Um, Sorry, uh, they take this as a uh, as a as a provocation to um, further test NATO resolve, right? Mm-hmm. So, in that sense, when you talk about the links between the Ukrainian and the Syrian conflict, those links are sort of all indirect, mm-hmm. in the sense that you know the French, you know, speculation that the French are less willing to be hardline on the Ukraine because of their anti ISIS interests and the the need to cooperate potentially with Russia and in Syria. So, you have all these kinds of indirect linkages. Mm-hmm. But the concern here is that this becomes part of the broader front of the confrontation of wills between NATO and Russia, and thereby the Russians continue to do things that uh, dare the Turks to shoot them down. Right. Uh, and the Turks feel compelled to take military action to reaffirm their resolve. That's where you get the kind of bad scenario. Right? Right. And that's not an impossible scenario. I'm just still not I, – I still don't see a clear route to that escalating – uh, to something that should really freak us out, right? right? Um, it could, uh, again, indirectly escalate. You know, maybe the Russians, you know, react to um, the situation worsening by trying to probe NATO elsewhere, right? right? Uh, whether that's um, – there's some indications they might be restarting things in Ukraine, you know, once the, the weather turns favorable mm-hmm. for that. Op- and you know, so maybe they push harder in Ukraine again, which was something that a lot of people, you know, six months – you know, three months ago would have said, you know, the – Putin just wants to wash his hands of Ukraine. Right, which is what it really out. looked like, yeah. Yeah, because it hasn't turned out very well, and they've paid attention to the way that the media has been covering Syria rather than Ukraine, but that's certainly a front where if the Russians wanted to show resolve or mm-hmm. show their their status, right, their great power status, mm-hmm. they might push back there. Um, you could imagine that this will put additional pressure if things worsen on NATO and the U.S. in particular to beef up its commitments further to the Baltics. This could be taken as a front to Russia. And these are the kinds of scenarios that I think are most likely for things going downhill. They're they're not they're not stuff where the primary, where the conflict, the sort of axis of conflict starts on the Turkish border, but where it gets dangerous might be elsewhere. Right. Well, one thing I'll be curious looking forward, and as a way for for the Russians to. Um well, it's an escalatory move, although it might potentially have de-escalatory long-term implications, is that the Russians essentially have control of the uh, Syrian air defense network, where the Syrian air defense network has effectively been shut down since the United States and other countries began bombing. And it's this sort of sub-Rosa collaboration that the United States has been engaged with the Syrian government, that we don't blow up all of their SAMs, and they don't target uh, us as we're flying sorties over Syria. Um, In addition to sort of de facto control over that, the Russians also have their own surface-to-air missile batteries, right? And so one, and this would be a, um, a bold move on the part of the Russians, would be simply to declare ownership over Syrian airspace, right? Um, and to activate these networks, with, which, which would then put the United States and NATO in a bind, because it wouldn't be able to continue the air campaign over Syria. It would be able over Iraq, but it would not be able to continue, continue the air campaign over Syria without taking out the Syrian air defense network. That's um, that's an excellent point. It's something I hadn't thought about, um, but it's but there, yeah, there you have some real dangers. I don't think the. I mean, I would be surprised if the United States, in particular, uh, NATO in general, but particularly the United States, would react. You know, I, I think the United States would likely say, "If you want to start shooting at us, shoot at us." Would try to call the Russian bluff. Mm-hmm. You can imagine the U.S. starting to target those SAMs. Which is, you know, usually what we do when we establish air superiority. The first thing we usually do is take out air defenses. Right. So you could switch and in, switch into that. You know, some people call this the American way of war. Right. Right. You could switch into that fairly quickly. Yeah, you know, that is a pretty dangerous scenario. Right, and there are there are there are escalatory layers because the questions would be, well, are we only targeting Syrian SAMs? Are Syrian SAMs tar- only targeting us versus Russian SAMs? Mm-hmm. Um, and it could get very complex, but it's a potential move. 
Um, now, of course, on Twitter this morning, uh, a narrative that has um, uh, uh, emerged you know, throughout the entire Syrian conflict, but people are saying that this is this is essentially one of the things that happens when the United States restrains itself, right? That this is a failure of American leadership, particularly Obama's leadership. I mean, when you hear that claim, how, how do you react to that, right? That when the United States does not control the situation, bad things happen like Russia and Turkey start shooting down each other's planes. So there are two sides to that. One is the sort of more general critique of Obama's Syria policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's actually a separate issue from the kind of we need to be, res- we need to be resolved with resolution and show strength with strength, right? You right, know, right, right. Show strong strength kind of issue. And here, you know, as you know, I, I've written a couple of things uh, most recently at uh, Foreign Affairs uh, uh, and elsewhere in which I've been very critical of this position. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't think that I don't think there's a plausible story um, in the real world of foreign affairs in which the U.S. somehow demonstrates a kind of resolve in a way that's worth it, given U.S. interests, Mm -hmm. uh, that somehow convinces the Russians not to take actions that they view as being in their strategic interests, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have friends who have argued quite stridently that somehow the mess in Syria is a consequence of the U.S. not being resolute enough on Ukraine, Right. right? And you push them on what the U.S. should do in Ukraine that would be more resolute, that is, beyond uh, what seem to be fairly effective sanctions, beyond um, uh, beyond uh, increasing uh, 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 fighter jet rotation in the Balts and elsewhere. And there's not a lot on the plate there, right? Because nobody says that, well, there, because nobody mm-hmm. says the U.S. should be deploying troops to Ukraine, or at least nobody's sane. Uh, and so it becomes that somehow if the U.S. were to offer lethal aid to Kiev, that would magically convince the Russians not to test us elsewhere. And I, I just don't think that's a plausible story, right? right. Uh, uh, and then the question is, okay, well, clearly you could, you could try to develop counterfactual Syria policies where the situation is – where the situation on the ground in Syria – was in such a posi- was in such a kind of status quo ante by 2015 that the Russians aren't intervening, right? So you can sort of make this kind of claim, but I'm not sure what the United States does to Russia that's reasonable from a U.S. perspective. That is, that doesn't get the U.S. into situations it doesn't want to be in, uh, or that no sane person would want the United States to be in, where somehow it it deters Russia from coming to the assistance of an ally, of one of its last allies, in a place that already has a military base, mm-hmm. you know, what that scenario is, I, I don't really understand it, right? It seems to me it's a kind of magical thinking about the, the role of strength and resolve in international affairs. Right, right. And the, I mean, the, 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 this particular element, this particular manifestation of the resolve argument is unfalsifiable, right? Because if the United States had responded more resolutely, uh, whatever, uh, in Ukraine, then we would explain the Syrian or the Russian intervention in Syria as necessary in order to demonstrate Russian resolve, right? And so it would be, we, there would be this cycle, right? So whether the, the, we can explain it, it doesn't explain anything, right? I mean, the, that, um, you know, at the same time, I, I think, I, I suspect, even though um, I'm not sure it was predictable from the perspective of 2011 that this would follow through, that there, 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 there's a bit of teeth to this argument that, look, if the United States had taken a more forthright approach in terms of creating some kind of status quo ante in Syria by 2015, then we wouldn't have this Russian intervention um, of course, that you know the Russians may have intervened earlier in order to save their naval interests, um, or may have intervened more assertively if the United States. And so, I, I suppose it's hard to it's very hard to work through those counterfactuals. Um, I suspect, however, that the Washington Post, for example, is going to be full of this kind of, of this kind of claim. Right, that by allowing the uh, Syrian situation to deteriorate as it has, you have invited Russia, which then invites all of this huge mess. Um, leading to the potential for much broader conflict, right? This is going to be a talking point in, in ter- for the interveners for the foreseeable future. Well, the dilemma right now from a U.S. political perspective is that while there's plenty of appetite for the U.S. to waive its military power and somehow resolve the Syrian conflict, there's not a lot of appetite for a major ground deployment. Right. Um, and it's very hard to imagine a better Syria from these kinds of, from this perspective, mm-hmm. 
uh, that doesn't require ha- – would not have required early on a much more massive U.S. commitment, including ground troops. Right. I mean, we've seen that uh, – you know, I think all the evidence of the last few years is that the idea that the U.S. could somehow identify an arm in a safe, non-blowback way Syrian moderates was always kind of a, a fantasy. Right. Um, well, yeah, and, and there, there have been a couple of recent articles about the conversations that happened in 2011, 2012 from within the Obama administration that have been quite critical that, that just strike me as fantasist, right? The Fred Hoff, right? That, that you could find these moderate rebel groups and heavily arm them and then some, somehow, you know, underpants gnome style, something good happens after that. But Petraeus being and Clinton being on this team without any clear... Uh, Sort of in the immediate wake of the Libya intervention, which seems to demonstrate all the problems that are associated with this, um, without any clear understanding of how this leads to the achievement of U.S. interests in Syria, other than this bias for action that we need to do something, we ought to be doing something. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, you can draw the story back, right? And you can say um, that the U.S. maybe things look better in a world where the United States is able to keep more troops in Iraq, right? This is one of the big criticisms of Obama is that somehow um, the Obama administration you know, mishandled the status of forces agreement negotiations in Iraq, mm-hmm. uh, either at the level of negotiations themselves or, you know, was, you know, was sort of too quick to say, if we don't have the right SOFA agreement, we're not going to stay there. Right. Um, and people point out that the United States has now got a comparable presence in Iraq without the same guarantee, without the guarantees that they sought mm-hmm. in the status of forces agreement that, that went south, right? This is way back when, we have to remember, the Bush administration negotiated a, a timeline for withdrawal that would happen if there wasn't a, a, a permanent status of forces agreement. Mm-hmm. The Obama administration inherited those negotiations. Right. Um, and now we have a big debate about, did they blow it? Did they, did they want too much? Did they not put pressure on the right people at the right time? And somehow, if the U.S. had had a, a larger presence in Iraq, that might have uh, prevented uh, the collapse of the Iraqi army that led to all the arms flowing into ISIS, which is how you get the problem with ISIS. Right. Um, but, you know, let's back up for a second because um, let's, you know, we can, we can imagine a scenario in which, you know, everything goes well from that perspective, right? Mm-hmm. ISIS remains, as Obama called them, the junior varsity league, right? Mm-hmm. They, they don't get this massive flood of arms, that allows them to to really go back into Syria and retake a whole bunch of territory or take a bunch of territory where they were had been previously on the defensive. So let's imagine that scenario. So mm-hmm. ISIS is not a major player in Syria. So then it becomes uh, a question of U.S. backed uh, quote unquote moderates, which includes some pretty radical Islamists, right, right in that coalition, right. um, versus Assad, right. So then is that a scenario that's better, right? Is that a scenario in which um, Assad is is lost already? I don't know. Or is that a scenario in which uh, you have a, a primary access of conflict between U.S. and Russian interests, which is much more intense? Right, right. You know, I, I don't know, right? I mean, so if your primary concern is the U.S. getting the best possible outcome and in, in darn the consequences, mm-hmm. um, maybe that looks better. If, you're, if your best case scenario, but if what you're really about is U.S.-Russian escalation, Maybe that scenario is worse. Right. I don't know. Okay, well, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, Foreign Tankums viewers, you'll be watching it this morning or this afternoon, and hopefully we'll all still be here to, <laughs> to, to view it. Um, so thanks a lot, Dan, and uh, we'll try to talk to you again soon. All right, so long. All right.